Hey everybody, this is Terry Plecknett of the Almost Sideways Podcast. You're watching our YouTube channel, and this is a short clip from our podcast. Make sure you find full episodes of our podcast wherever you find your podcasts. And our featured review is going to be looking at uh, the new release just came out in theaters and HBO Max uh, this weekend, planning on being a, somewhat of an awards contender. And that is Judas and the Black Messiah, uh, starring Daniel Kaluuya, Lakey Sanfield, Jesse Plemons. Zach, tell us all about uh, Judas and the Black Messiah and what you thought. All right, so Judas and the Black Messiah is this 1973 film starring Pam Greer and Richard Roundtree, directed by uh, Jack Hill. Oh, wait, never mind. It just sounds like it's a black exploitation movie. Doesn't that have a great black exploitation title? Like, come on. Yeah, well, yeah I, can, I can see it. Yeah. Okay, anyway. No, that was a lame joke. Uh, the actual Judas and the Black Messiah is uh, the new movie by Shaka King starring Daniel Kaluuya as the Black Panthers leader in Chicago, um, Fred Ham Hampton, who uh, was um, uh, crucial as an orchestrator um, of, um, you know, co co coordinating the community around um, the Black Panthers in the, in the early 70s. He also was a target by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover in this movie is played by a heavily makeuped uh, Martin Sheen. Um, and uh, the movie tells the story not, it's not a straightforward biopic of Fred Hampton's life, but it more looks at this kind of crucial point in his life in which the FBI tried to infiltrate the Black Panthers. And the way they did this was by employing um, a, a, a driver named Bill O'Neill, who's played in this movie by Lakeith Stanfield, um, to, as basically a mole inside the Black Panthers to relay information back to J. Edgar Hoover and uh, an FBI uh, officer played by Jesse Plemons. His name is Roy Mitchell in the movie. Um, this movie feels a lot like The Departed. It's, uh, the, the, it's unmissable, some of the parallels. Um, and it feels like, I guess you could say, if you're being crude, you could sort of say it's like The Departed meets Malcolm X um, in the sense that it's about, uh, you know, uh, moles inside this, this unit, um, but also about black activism in the 1960s and 70s. Um, you know, if you're going to make a biopic today, you can't really do a straightforward biopic. Um, it's kind of lame to do the, he was born at this time and then grew up. And what I really liked about this movie is that, um, not only did it look at this, this specific point of Fred Hampton's life, not only was it not entirely about Fred Hampton, but it was based on a true story. And the way we know that is because it incorporates archival footage from the PBS, um, mini series Eyes on the Prize 2, which aired in the late eighties, early nineties. And I just think that's a really cool way to kind of show this was a true story. It's so much more interesting than just having that title on, on the uh, screen that says this is based on a true story. Um, and as you watch the movie, it actually becomes that that part of the movie becomes really important, especially by the end of the movie in ways that, that you wouldn't expect. Um, Daniel Kaluuya's role performance in, uh, as Fred Hampton in this movie is magnificent. Uh, he, he has a body transformation. He has the oration skills. He, he, is, he magnifies the room. He electrifies the room. And Daniel Kaluuya is maybe not the first actor you would think to do that because when I think Daniel Kaluuya, I think like Get Out or Widows where he plays these kind of more subdued, almost quiet characters. Um, but in this movie, he he dominates and uh, he's gotten the Best Supporting Actor nomination from the Golden Globes. I think he's a strong contender for Best Supporting Actor at the Oscars. But I think equally brilliant in this movie is Lakeith Stanfield who plays this protagonist who we're not really sure what his motivations are. He kind of remains this question mark throughout the movie. Is he loyal to the Panthers? Is he loyal to the FBI? What's kind of going on in his head? And um, I think he, Stanfield does a great job of just having that kind of distance between um, what what we perceive of him and what he's really thinking. And I, and I think credit also goes to the writing and direction of this movie by Shaka King. This is a great movie. Uh, I, I think it does everything that you want to see in a historical fact-based movie about real people. I knew a little bit about Fred Hampton going into this movie. I did not know anything about Bill O'Neill going into this movie. I found out a lot about these people. They meant a lot to me. Um, and uh, it told the story in a ridiculously entertaining way. Um, I, I was on the edge of my seat for a, a lot of this movie. The Jesse Plemons character too is really fascinating in a lot of ways that are unpredictable and unexpected as well. 
Um, I the, the, the only flaw of the movie is the Martin Sheen character. He comes off a little bit. He, he, he reminds me of Leo and Jay Edgar. It's just uh, not not a bad, uh, not something you want to be compared to. But other than that, um, this movie got better as it went along. And I give it four stars. If this was a 2020 movie, it would have been on my top 10 of the year list. Uh, it, I, I hope it gets a lot of Oscar recognition. It does everything that you hope the historical drama that is thrilling and exciting um, does. It's uh, informative and entertaining and, um, you know, an awesome watch. So there you go. All right. All right. Four stars from Zach. Loved it. Todd, how about you? Where are you at with this one? Uh... Okay, so the movie starts out with archival footage, which I thought was kind of annoying. Similar to Defy Blood, it's like the footage is meant to get you riled up to watch the movie because evidently they couldn't do that themselves. Like, just show me. It's not a documentary. Like, that was a really bad way to start the movie. And the confrontations in the movie, I felt, were really stagey, whether they're in a car or in the bar or in a like stairwell. They never feel organic. It's just like they... They, uh, they, you know, they set up shop and they have a conversation that never feels like I'm watching a movie. Everything has to be a play uh, for this Oscar season, apparently. And this is no different. Uh, and they also use music from Sideways in this twice. Like the when Miles after right after Miles and Maya like first hook up, it, they use that bit of music when Fred and Deborah first kiss. And again, when he gets out of jail. I, now, I don't even know if that's original to Sideways anymore. I always assumed it was Rolfie Kent's score, but maybe it's not. Like, it took me out of the movie for, like, a minute because it was so distracting and just a really, really odd choice. Did you guys catch that? Yes. I, I was, not. I was wondering weird, who would no, if either of you would notice it. I'm, I'm how glad. weird is that? <laughs> was, is that Sideways music? <laughs> I... I have no clue. I, th I thought it was Rolfie's original music too. It wasn't listen. I, I went on like a 15 minute deep dive about it. I didn't see any attribution to either. Rolfie Ken. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, either way, odd choice. Um, I think Lucky Stanfield is amazing in the movie. He's the most nuanced and most complicated character. And I don't know why he isn't getting any Oscar love because he is every bit as good as General Kaluuya, who definitely gives the loudest performance, but it's also another killer performance with his eyes like only he can really do like he is absolutely going to win the oscar or at least be runner up it, it reminded me a, a little bit of like robert duvall and the apostle with like how just electrifying he is to watch uh, and jesse Plemons is sympathetic and he plays it in a way that only he, really he could do i guess too uh the movie i i think well it, it like kind of dabbles in a whole bunch of different genres which is an intriguing way to tell the story and makes it not just like a chicago seven like style biopic where it's a little loose with the facts and just for dramatic effect like because of this the movie like really moves like you don't necessarily even need to take it seriously to be really entertained by it and yeah the makeup work on martin sheen is i mean it's truly terrifying and really bad <laughs> I, I don't know what, i don't know what that was uh but like every other movie up for awards this year i have mixed feelings i think the screenplay is really jumbled and i guess that's what you get when you have a a, a writing team of a comedy writer, the director, and then the twins from 22 Jump Street working together, all of them making their first movie, which you can kind of tell, like it, it kind of is a kind of a mess uh, at times. And I, I, there's also this really lame wink at the Oscars where Jesse Plum looks directly into the camera and says that uh, O'Neill might be worthy of an Academy Award. I was just, I just like rolled my eyes. I was like, it was just such a bad moment. And one thing I thought would have made the movie better if they had leaned on the fact that that uh, Hampton was only 21, like not someone who looks like they're in the mid 30s, which, you know, Daniel Kaluuya does. That would have given it another layer of power. And I also didn't really like the like inside FBI stuff because like the best scene in the movie is when Mitchell is at the rally, because that's what that character should have been. He should have just been like lingering around, poking O'Neill, you know, keeping him in line and, and, you know, just like looking more like a villain than somebody you eventually have some sort of affection for. Like all those scenes with him and like uh, with Clemens and the, and his boss or like them on the phone with J. Edgar Hoover would just seem completely out of place. So it, it, that would have been more of like a mini series kind of like vibe. And maybe that would have served the story better. I really want to give this three stars, but I can't. I'm giving it two and a half stars. Ooh. ooh. Wow. Wow. All right. Well, uh, that leaves it to me. And uh, I, I'm, of course, in the middle, but I'm much, much closer to Zach. I'm giving this three and a half stars, um, and I I really I really enjoyed it. I th I I agree with most of what Zach said that it, it was extremely engaging. The performances are incredible. Um, uh, I think T Todd mentioned uh, Daniel Kaluuya acting with his eyes. I think Lakeith Stanfield is very good at, with that too. 
and uh, just uh, how much he can just act with his face. And that's something that is kind of hard to do. And he, both of them are very good at it. Um, yeah, Jesse Plemons is doing Jesse Plemons things here. Um, when I saw Martin Sheen, I thought like John Lithgow in Bombshell. Like that was kind of the, the makeup work that looked like was done on Martin Sheen there. Um, but uh, I, there were there were a few things I, I, I struggled with. Oh, and also don't forget uh, Dominique Fishback, who we talked about um, as the, the little girl in uh, Project Power who apparently was like 35 when she played that character in that movie with uh, Jamie Foxx. And now she's actually playing a little closer to her age. Um, but uh, it was cool to see her in something else. Um, but a, a couple things with this one. Um, yeah. Martin Sheen was distracting. Also Lil Rel Howery. That was a, just a distracting character that didn't quite feel like it, it fit. I mean, his scene was crucial, but it was just weird to see him, you know, dread, literally dressed up like something out of a seventies black exploitation movie. Um, and then uh, the, the main thing I, I struggled with was um, it really made uh, it made Fred Hampton out to be almost like this angelic, perfect figure. Like, like usually when you look at something like this, you look at a character like this, you want to see, you want to see the entirety of their, of that person warts and all. And I think it it really for for dramatic effect left out the warts. I mean, I I don't know that much about him, but I, there, you know, there had to be some sort of other side to him that you'd never see. Like you you, it really makes him out to be a a Christ like figure, like the title says, um, in trying to to make him as uh, as uh, heroic and uh, and perfect as possible. And um, really try and build him up as this archetype of what you want to, what you want to achieve, achieve to be. Um, that was really one of the one of the only things I, I had trouble with is that it never showed him in that other light of being that like that like perfect, perfect figure. But other than that, I I loved it. The performances were great. The the I thought the writing was was great. The direction was really good too. Um, and uh, I, I thought it was also interesting. Like, there's several movies this um, this award season that you can look at and uh, pull back to Trial of Chicago Seven. Like, we talked about how Mangrove was very similar to Trial of Chicago Seven in the type of story it told. And then you have Judas and the Black Messiah, which um, I mean, Fred Hampton is in Trial of Chicago Seven. He's he's the guy who's always sitting behind Bobby Seale, and they all they even talk about this event in trial of the Chicago seven. Um, and this is just a much darker, grittier version of, of some of the stuff that, uh, the trial of Chicago seven was dealing with. So, um, I'm giving it three and a half, um, um, pretty solid three and a half stars for me, but, um, but yeah, I, I'm much closer to Zach than I am to Todd on this one. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought up the Chicago seven because Bo likewise, Bobby seal is also mentioned in this movie. Yeah. Uh, too. In the trial, it, uh, yeah. with Bobby seal. Yeah. And I think this is a perfect kind of companion piece to the Chicago 7, and I think it actually sort of exploits some of the Chicago, Chicago 7's weaknesses as a movie, which is that it's talky. It's very much about characters, uh, you know, who are kind of from this upper crust white intelligentsia who are rubbing shoulders with each other almost as celebrities. Whereas this movie is about what it was like on the streets, okay? What it was like in the protests, in the movement, in the Black Panthers meetings, um, and um, going to your point, Terry, about Fred Hampton as a character, um, I think they kind of do show that one of his flaws in a way was how he butted heads with the crowns in this movie and how, you know, in, in his attempts to, to seek out solidarity among other activist groups, um, he wasn't always the most um, respected, even in Chicago. And that was something that, um, you know, eventually he comes around and gets. But, you know, and then at the same time, too, the the character with the with the warts in this movie, so to speak, is is the Bill O'Neill character. I mean, I yeah. think that's well, that's what he functions as is is the is the person who you really have se severe kind of moral doubts about. Um, going back to what Todd said, though, I don't I don't find the screenplay that muddled. I mean, I I think that it the the, the exchanges that the characters have are all really fascinating. I found the dialogue to be really realistic. And I thought that the, the Jesse Plemons character in particular was someone who was complex in the ways that he's, he's someone who is a part of the FBI as a system, and yet he has to suppress 
you know, his own feelings about what he works for. And yeah, maybe that dynamic would have been explored more in a miniseries, but I thought that Jesse Plemons did a great job of showing that in the scenes that, that he had. So I don't know what more this movie could have done. I think your criticism is that it should have gone deeper as a miniseries, which I think means that you thought it was a good movie. Well, no, I mean, I, I feel like the the movie is really specific, but it makes you want to feel like it's universal, but it's not. So that that's the problem with having the scenes with the FBI is that is that it, it takes away from the message of the movie, and and that that makes it be more of a genre movie and not something that you're actually going to take something away from, like morally or something like that, you know? Because like the, the, you you're not supposed to like the FBI character, like he's supposed to be the guy who's forcing O'Neill to do things that he doesn't want to do or or that he it might be morally opposed to but he really is just out for himself sort of I don't know I mean but it like when you show him at his work then it takes away from the actual plot of the movie I feel like let's see but that's like where where I think the archival footage is really important and I'm surprised that you you really didn't like the use of that because like I feel like the Bill O'Neill character speaks for himself in a way that um, doesn't show the director's sort of agenda in any way. And I think that stuff is really powerful because it actually tells the you know significance of, of who this character was and his feelings about what happens over the course of this movie, even though you can never read him. He has a poker face the whole time. I thought that was a really unique framing device as a story. Well, I don't, I don't, the interview with O'Neill, like I, I don't have a problem with that. It was like everything else, like just showing the, the footage at the beginning is just something that's supposed to like get you just riled up to to go watch this movie about about the black panthers and about these activists and like they couldn't have done that in a way where th they didn't have to use someone else's footage i mean i mean i i felt the same thing in, in defy bloods it was it, it was like th you, they show you shocking images that were real because they want you to go into it with a certain mindset but they couldn't do that organically so they just i don't I think, know i think all that showing is that this is a real story, and here are some of the pieces of it. I, no, I think you're being pretty picky and petty with that, and I, I, I see no problem with that. Well, that wasn't even one of my. That was just the the the, the thing that started off wrong. But I, I mean, I I have way more problems with the middle of the movie and and how it, how it's told. But I don't think the the conversations are organic at all. Like when he goes to, uh, you know, recruit the other people for the Rainbow Coalition, like th those things just seemed like such staged like nonsense like th there's no way anything happened like that they just like roll up into a bar and then all of a sudden they're all like at a standoff like right across from each other and they start pulling guns on each other like i i it's, it's just it, everything just felt like it, it was just i mean it was a big setup it was it never felt real but it they felt like a play. they've explained that in the movie though they, sh they it, it's sometimes through secondhand dialogue but like the jesse Plemons character explains basically what happens to these other black militant groups who are very much um, paranoid about FBI infiltration. And I think that explains why there's so much hostility between these groups, even if it's not necessarily clear in that moment in the movie. I would also just kind of like to second what you said, Terry, about Dominique Fishback. In, in a perfect world with a better Oscar campaign, she would be getting serious supporting actress um, consideration. She's phenomenal in this movie. And uh, I don't know why this movie is, isn't getting more traction with the Oscars, but um, maybe it got released too late. Maybe it's the 2021 thing. I don't know. But I mean, this is a movie that should be getting a lot more attention than it's getting, for, particularly for those three leads. And um, it's, it's disappointing that it's not. Well, I think... Daniel Kaluuya is one of the favorites. I mean, I, th I think it's like him and Sasha Baron Cohen right now are looking at as the favorites for best yeah. supporting actor. Where's Lee Odom Jr.? Yeah, let's... yeah, yeah. He's he's in that mix too. I mean, we haven't really had a major award um, award show yet, so we really don't know where everything's sitting. But I think it's it's pretty safe to say he's right in that mix. And at this point, no one would argue if he won the Oscar. Um, I for me, if he wins it, he it's definitely deserved. Um, because he he is incredible in this. One of the things that I've heard, um, one of the criticisms I've heard about this movie is that it kind of, um, the movie gets slow in the middle uh, because Daniel Kaluuya is not involved in the middle. Um, and and it's true, but I think that also that, that plays into kind of the mood of the story as well. I mean, it's supposed to kind of do that, um, but that just shows how dynamic a performance he gives in the fact that if he's not on screen, all you want is him to be back on screen. <laughs> I'm good with Lakeith Stanfield. Like him and Jesse Plemons, those are my guys. <laughs> so, I mean, 
Well, and, and they, yeah, and they give great performances too. Yeah, yeah, that like that that role. You you could kind of say Jesse Plemons in this is very similar to like Joseph Gordon Levitt in Chicago Seven, in that in that he's he starts off as one thing, and as the movie goes along, he kind of wants to be something else and isn't allowed to be in a lot of ways. I don't know. I kind of got that vibe from from him. I feel like Chicago Seven is a much more polished version of of a similar story. Um, where this is a lot more raw. And so depending on what you like, if you like the polish or if you like the raw, it'll tell you which one you like more. Or um, put another way, I don't I don't know if white voters are gonna be down with this movie. I mean, I, I just could I, I think that you know for, for a lot of older white voters, the prospect of giving um sympathizing with an outwardly socialist uh you know um orator uh, in the vein of Fred Hampton is something that they're still not necessarily comfortable doing. I'm talking about older white voters, the ones that are more comfortable with Green Book, because that was still only two years ago. And I think Chicago 7 is a much more sanitized version of similar events uh, that they would be more comfortable giving the award to. But hey, you never, I don't know. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. All right, so we've got four stars from Zach. We got three and a half from me. We've got two and a half from Todd. Uh. Uh, so, so yeah, that is, that is uh, Judas and Black Messiah. Make sure you uh, you check that out. It is in theaters and on HBO Max right now. So, 